We've come to the end of the first masterclass, and, and after each masterclass, we're going to have a short discussion where one of us takes the, the, the role of interrogator and uh, starts asking a few questions. So, Simon, you've been teaching Haskell and Erlang for, for several years now. Mm. What, what do you see the advantages and disadvantages of the different languages, and how, how do you see the things you learnt in Haskell going over to Erlang and, and vice versa? Well, that's a good question. I think, I think our students find Erlang more approachable. I think the fact it's a small language, relatively, fewer syntactic constructs, fewer, fewer things, well, types initially not being there or being very weakly typed is a very good thing, I think. I think later on, the major disadvantage of teaching Erlang is the lack of a strong type system. So doing, doing type-driven de design is more difficult, you know, saying here's the type, here's the type of the functions we want to define, let's define the functions against that. It's harder to make that stick in Erlang. Yeah. But I think that would be the one big disadvantage. But you've also been teaching Erlang, but you don't come from this strongly typed background. How, how long does it take people to become proficient in Erlang? It depends, but rule of thumb, it will depend very much from programmer to programmer. But yeah, having taught it, uh, people out in the industry, um, someone who's worked with a particular technology for about a decade, it will take him about six months to become completely productive. And the six months, it's not a learning curve, it's more of an unlearning curve. So <laughs> unlearning uh, the object-oriented way of right. doing so, so things. Or well, but that's true of our students as well. Yeah. Because our, well, students have just learned, uh, our students have just learned objects. Yes. They are, all they know is Java. So not would it be better well. if they hadn't learned this at all? No, I think, uh, my feeling is if they've learned one language well, one, one paradigm well, yes. then learning another is, is not a yeah. problem. I don't, it's, I'm not of the school where I think there's only one true way. I think you know, OO is good in some circumstances, right. Erlang and functional programming is good in others. And I think the students gain from learning two different paradigms. Right. So okay. even if they're going to be Java programmers, never write any Erlang. The fact they know there are different ways of doing it is, is to their value. And the good students see that. They understand immutability, they understand so, different So what's the thing they find most difficult? Recursion is difficult to start with. Mm. Understanding that, that recursion is, the, is the, the motive power of the language. There are no right. constructs like while loops and so on. Um, the fact that Nothing, there aren't side effects can be a problem because I think they've learned OO and they understand that objects do things yes. and things are done to objects and their state changes. So moving to a world where you're thinking about values and calculation and messages passing between processes, that's a, that's a different model for and, and do you find that, that people find recursion difficult or? Well, when people learn Erlang, I tend to find they've got their three hurdles uh, in learning it. And the first hurdle is pattern matching is actually optimally using pattern matching. Uh, the first set of exercises, and we'll use if statements and case statements, and you sit down with them, you review the code, and you re rewrite everything, getting rid of them, mm -hmm. and start pattern matching in the function heads. Uh, the second hurdle is understanding recursion, and the whole concept of tail recursion versus non-tail recursion, which you know, in Erlang is very important. And the third uh, kind of hurdle is thinking concurrently. Uh, making sure that you design your system having a process for Because it, cause it surprises activity. me that both of you said recursion and, and pattern matching. Because mm. I would think that the concurrency bit is the difference, well, you know, not using processes. I mean, it's partly, we, we're talking about the, func the yeah. functional bit of the language here, and that's, that's what I'm teaching right at the moment to our students. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about that. But I, th I think the model, I think the, the model of concurrency, the, the message passing model, is a very, is a very yeah. clear and, one. And both of you, what, what do you think the best way to learn that language is? Practice. 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 Uh, you know, so you, you don't, need a problem, you need to you, solve. You don't yeah. learn to yeah. swim by reading a book about swimming and, and, and mm, could do. swimming a language. <laughs> <laughs> but you wouldn't do it very well, very right? No. So no. I, th I think, and I say this to my students, yeah. you know, you're not going to, things aren't necessarily easy, and, but things become easier the more you do them. Yeah. So understanding, um, you know, understanding, trying things out. I think one, one funny thing our students sometimes do, they write a program and they think, okay, I've done that, but they don't compile it, they don't test it necessarily. Um, so I think making sure that they do that, they engage with it, they use test data and so on. Um, or they, they might use properly based testing. We're, we're thinking of doing that this year with mm. our students. Um, and do so they like it? I mean, do they? Do they uh, well, here they are. They've been doing Java, and now there's this funny thing that. that uh, I think what's a, a real selling point for Erlang is the fact that it is used in anger for doing right. real programming. I think that makes a big difference. We know that Haskell is increasingly being used, say, in the financial industry, but I think the fact that Erlang 
is used in something like WhatsApp. Yes. Um, or and, and the history of so that. So did that, when the area. WhatsApp came out, did that cause a stir? For oh, yes, yeah, certainly. People go in and yes. say, hey, look, yeah. it's really being yeah. used. Yeah, and also, we've, we've, we've had a history over the years. Francesca has been coming for perhaps 12 years or so to talk to our functional programming students. Right. Sometimes when we were teaching them Haskell, recently, Francesca has... has not come, but an, uh, somebody from Erlang Solutions, Torben Hoffman, has yes, come yeah. and has given a very inspiring talk to the students. To, to, and he's very good at saying how yes. Erlang is different. One question I got once is, you know, why are, are you know, you, we're learning Haskell and you've given us a lecture over how Erlang is being used in the real world. Why are they actually teaching us Haskell and not Erlang? Right. And you know, the natural answer there was, you're here to learn how to learn. Yes. And because you know, I mean, I've, yeah. seen, it, I've yeah. seen it in the conferences from yes. functional programming being a, a single session in yeah. one track to entire conferences exactly. devoted yeah, to exactly. it. Exactly. So it's, yeah, yeah. it's not quite mainstream yet, but it's definitely it's getting, impinging yeah, yeah. upon people's consciences. No. But I think you know, I, I don't have strong feelings. I enjoy teaching Haskell. I enjoy teaching Erlang. Yes. I think next year we're going to teach our students a compiling techniques course right. using OCaml, yes. and that's you know that's fine because the approaches there's so yes. much more in common than there is, um, and I think it's 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 a great shame if people become doctrinaire and say you know, it's it's like Stalinists and Trotskyists. They see bigger differences no, between. I, I, I see it as. as I mean, oh no, I wasn't you suggesting, no, I wasn't suggesting no, no, you were joking. No, no, at all, but I, yeah. I'm thinking that, that once you've learned Ruby or something like that, or Python, uh, you know, it's a way of thinking. Yeah, and, and precisely. And one maps fairly naturally onto the other. So yeah. once you've learned Haskell, you know, up to monads and things like that, it, it looks very much like Erlang. Yeah. You just move the brackets around a bit. Yes. You take the brackets out, actually, yeah. and you move the commas. This and that can be a and noise. And it's but students find the Haskell syntax much more difficult than the Erlang syntax. Right. Yeah, well, I always did. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I couldn't see how many... I, I, I think of things as being defined as three arguments, and it gets called with two arguments. Yeah, oh, like indeed. Oh, well, that's where's because, the extra argument gone? Yeah, no, indeed. So currying and things like that, I never, never really liked. And so liked. our students do find that tricky. And so the Erlang being rather more concrete and sometimes a bit noisier syntactically yeah. isn't a problem for them. No. Um, so I found Haskell and Erlang, at least we taught in universities, very complementary of each other mm. yeah. as well. And my opinion is that any student you know, taking a computer science degree should learn both. Have, so have you ever done that? You've People have started with Haskell, have then learned Erlang or the other way around and did that? Well, did, it, did would be, it would be really interesting to do some, some experimentation, but I, the trouble is it's so difficult yes. to get rid of all the right. confounding. Right. I don't think you can get defensible data in yeah. that area. But certainly anecdotally, I think our students, partly because you're teaching, in teaching Erlang, you're teaching both new ideas in functional programming and new ideas in yes. concurrency. Um, and we're saying it's a means to an end to understand all these different paradigms, and you can, t and, and there are applications out there at the end. I think that, that, that fits better. So, so you talked a lot about the things that were good in Erlang hmm. and the kind of problems that it was good at, but you didn't say anything about problems it was bad at. So, so what kind of problems would Erlang be totally un inappropriate for solving, and what would you do about that? Well, one thing I mentioned was the type-driven development thing. Yes. You know, it would be nice if Erlang's, you know, for example, Dialyzer were better integrated with, yes. with Erlang. Because I think it would, you know, it would be nice to be able to say, we're defining a function that takes expressions mm. to Booleans, and you could oh, check... And what about integration with other languages? And were they completely untyped? Mm, I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm not talking about Haskell, I'm talking about sure. you know, connecting it to Python or to C or something like that. Is that a problem? That's right. what we do all the time. Right. I mean, we use Erlang as the glue okay. uh, to handle the whole orchestration, and then we use... You know, Python, C, Julia. No, not at all. It's it is actually language intended, yes. you know, to, to act as a hub, you know, towards other languages. And you know, interface it could be protocols, it yes. could be you know, RESTful APIs or other programming languages. Mm. It's um, it's ideal for that. And I think being able to say, I mean, look at the big Erlang applications. They run with they run as C and 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 Erlang, and they work. You know, they they work very well together. So I think. But it's one of those things, again, which if we're teaching this to second year students, they're not at a stage where perhaps they understand software architecture in any sort of a, any right. substantial way. So understanding that systems might have C at the bottom and yes. Erlang in the middle. Because I, I, I'm just wondering. Top, is, uh, that's something new for them. Yeah, um, but, but I mean, things like that are common to all functional languages, this idea of immutable data mm. and things like that. Is that, I mean, I see it like in things like Git. Yes, you know, sure. The fact that you know, Git works because with immutable data you mm. can cache things and, and you can reason about them. Do, do, they, do they see the benefits? Of I see the benefits. Of it. Do I they see the benefits? Of I it? think, I mean, for our students, perhaps it's a bit early for that. Right. We can show them that they can write very direct, they can write nice recursive, yes. equa nice recursive descriptions of 
transformations over trees or whatever. I mean, the stuff I've been doing in this master class, mm. that those are very direct. Um, because it, it's funny, I, when I teach it, the, the students yeah. start asking, they say, where's the debugger? Mm. And, and I said, well, there isn't a debugger. Mm. Or, or there is a debugger, but, but no Erlang programmers use it. And they say, yeah. well, why is that? And I said, well, because you don't have variables that are changing under your feet, so that mm. it's difficult to reason mm. about it. You know, the, once they've got a value, they've got the value forever. Yes, and, no, and they really? acquire exactly. it in one place, and, yeah. and therefore you don't need to track it. The only, fr the only problem, and I've been talking to students about that this week, they say, well, you've got these variables in functions. Those change. So you've got to say... Each instance of a variable is immutable, so there are, there are subtleties there. I would ju just add where not to use Erlang, I think two very distinct cases are, for example, number crunching, yes. mm. and your know, graphical interfaces, you know, the libraries are appalling, and yeah, I think they're so much better. So if you had to language. choose one strong point for Erlang, what, what, would, what would you say was its unique strong point, or, or one or two, what would you say about that? Massive concurrency, orchestration. Mm. Um, the, the fact that your systems behave in a predictable way under extreme heavy load, right. uh, extreme heavy load under extended period or under extremely high peak load as well. You won't, you, know, you won't get any degradation of throughput in your system.